No, the eyes have it. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Minister, what is the economic impact of the Morrison government's reduction of JobKeeper in 24 days' time? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Gallagher, for your question. Um, first of all, I would reiterate that the government is extending the payments to people who are on unemployment benefits with the extension of the coronavirus supplement from the end of September until Christmas. Um, and it, it, any assertions that, that, that there is anything other than an extension, an extension of a payment, Order. Uh, an extension of a payment Order. is actually false and misleading. As I said yesterday, every single person in this chamber, every single person in this chamber, who came in here in March when we put forward a massive package of order. reforms, Senator Wong, on a point of order. <laughs> a point of order is direct relevance. Um, I know the minister is reading from a prepared brief. The question went to the reduction. Those were the words used: the reduction of job seeking. Um, Senator Wong, I, I, ask can't, to return to the I question. can't. That, that's not a point of direct relevance. Uh, Senator Cormann, on the uh, point uh, of order. Uh, th th one should never mislead the chamber, but certainly one should never mislead the chamber in a um, point of order. Job seeker is not being reduced; it's, it's being absolutely not reduced. The coronavirus supplement is being extended. Job seeker remains. Precisely as order. Um, I, I think order. I'll, ru I'll rule on the point of order when there's silence. This is traditionally a time the opposition values. I'll rule on the point of order. Um, Senator Wong, um, that goes to the terminology and the substance of an answer, which is a matter for debate. Um, I cannot instruct the minister how to answer a question. The minister is being directly relevant. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. And, um, what I would say is that the assertions that are made by those opposite just clearly show that they do not understand what they actually voted for themselves when they were here in this place. Um, and Order. secondly, um, Senator Wong, I'm quite happy to take that interjection. In fact, I'm quite happy to, to continue to answer this question without even, uh, without even looking down, Senator Wong. But Order. there you go. Senator you can waste Wong. as much time as you like in the answering of this question by your interjections. That's entirely up to you. But, uh, Mr. President, Mr. President, I mean, those opposites show their extraordinary ignorance of understanding of the budgetary process and the economy if they think that one measure in isolation is, is going to actually tell them the answer to. The impact of the suite of measures that are put in place by our government has enabled this economy to be cushioned through a once-in-a-century pandemic that totally and totally has destroyed the economies of every country around the world. And Australia yesterday demonstrated that despite the fact that Australia and Australians have been significantly been impacted by this coronavirus, we have actually fared very well on the basis of the economic stimulus that our government put in place in March to support all Australians, individuals and businesses throughout the pandemic. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. After the biggest economic quarterly contraction on record, the Morrison government has already accepted that we'll see further contraction in the next quarter. Minister, this is the fourth or fifth time I have asked you this question. What is the economic impact of the Morrison government's reduction of JobSeeker and the coronavirus supplement in 24 days' time? Senator Rustin. Thank you, Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, look, once again, um, you are probably directing your question in relation to economic impact to the wrong minister. I make my decisions Order. on what I, that the, that the money that is provided through the, uh, the stimulus— Order I on my provide left. My, advi Order. my advice to government in relation to uh, the initiatives that are put in place around social policy on Order. the basis. On the basis, you'd like me to divulge by ERC um, discussions Order. now, would you? I make my decisions when it comes to social policy on the basis of putting in place the economic supports that people need, depending on the circumstances that are before them. And right now we are in the midst of a pandemic and the government made a decision and was announced in July that we would continue to provide additional levels of support to people who find themselves unemployed until Christmas. Uh, my decisions Order. are always based on the social impact and the social Order. impairments of the people that I represent. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Extraordinary. Uh, thank you, Mr President. With the 1.5 million Australians relying on support and 13 applicants for every single job, 
Why is it that the minister can't tell us what the economic impact is of cutting economic support or cutting financial support for those on job seeker with the coronavirus supplement? Does the minister take any responsibility for making the recession deeper and longer by cutting the coronavirus supplement and cutting wages at the worst possible time? Yeah. Senator Rustin. Well, look, thank you very much, and um, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Gallagher, for your question. But once again, it just shows your lack of understanding about government budgeting processes and how the economy actually works. To actually take one single payment, one Order. single initiative, and Senators expect that one Watt. initiative to be the single thing that impacts on the economy just shows a complete lack of understanding the rule, about how Senator e e economics works and how our budget works. Clearly this, government, clearly, this government has put in place the largest ever stimulus package to support the, ec the economy through the coronavirus pandemic. We have put in place initiatives that support people who are unemployed, people to remain engaged with their employers, Senator small Polly. businesses, large businesses, sectors of the economy that have been massively impacted. We have put in $314 billion worth of support to the Australian economy, and yet all those opposite can do is ask me a question about one little tiny part of it. Shows your lack of understanding. Order, order, order. On my left, on my left, Senator Wong. Senator Wong. Senator Keneally. Senator Antic is on his feet, asking, a waiting to ask a question. Senator Antic. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the Morrison government is working to get Australians back into jobs and on the road to economic recovery? The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Antic for the question. Mr. President, as we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic has had a devastating impact on Australia, Australians, the global economy, and it has seen Australia fall into recession. But the Morrison government moved decisively, uh, in fact, as Minister Rustin has articulated earlier this year, uh, to stop the spread of COVID-19, protecting the health of Australians, uh, but also we moved decisively to protect the livelihood of Australians through our measures, such as JobKeeper, which is, of course, keeping that really important connection between around 3.5 million Australians, between them as employees and their employers. Mr President, nearly all Australians have had their lives impacted in some way or another by COVID-19, uh, but in particular it is still having a significant impact on certain sectors of Australia. And In that regard, I note what is occurring in Victoria, uh, where so many are still subject to very strict lockdown measures. But, Mr President, as large parts of our economy begin to reopen uh, in the coming months, the government is focused on getting Australians back into work. And, Mr President, our job maker plan it will return Australians to work and help Australians' economy return to growth. Every minister, every department, led by the Prime Minister from the top, we are working to put job creation front and centre of everything we do. And Mr President, our long-term, because we have a long-term plan for Australians, unlike those opposite, all they have is just frivolous comments. Our long-term plan to get Australians back into work will actually chart the way forward for a new generation of economic success. And of course, Mr President, uh, we will continue to build on this plan. We'll undertake that important skills reform that I've referred to, the industrial relations reform, removing unnecessary red tape, and of course delivering a record infrastructure spend. Because when you invest in infrastructure, as we all know, you create jobs. Locking in affordable and reliable energy, boosting our manufacturing capability, and of course, as Senator Birmingham well knows, opening new export markets to create Order, even more Cash. opportunities Senator and jobs. A supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, how has the government's strong record of economic management and job creation enabled us to respond to COVID-19 and plan for economic recovery from a position of strength? Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, I do remind uh, those on this side of the chamber that of the promise that those opposite took the la to the last election for Australian people: $387 billion in new taxes. Can you only imagine? Can you only imagine the position that Australians would now be in if those opposite had been able to legislate $387 billion in new taxes? 
And you know what the irony is? They stand here and they say they are the friends of small and family businesses. The last thing they need are more taxes, which is exactly what you had said you would promise them, and perhaps that's why they didn't vote for you. But, Mr. President, we entered COVID-19 from a position of economic strength and record employment. In fact, the employment figures in March 2020 showed that employment in Australia was actually at a record high of in excess of 13 million people. And Mr President, that is why we continue to focus on job creation front and centre Order. of Senator policy. Cash, Senator Antic, a, supplement, a final supplementary question. Order. Senator Watt and Mackenzie. Senator Antic. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, can you please update the Senate on the recent ABS labour force figures and any insights they provide into the nation's recovery from COVID-19? Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Mr. President. And despite the devastating impact that COVID-19 has had on our economy, the ABS labour force figures for the month of June and July they actually demonstrate the ongoing resilience of employers out there and the ongoing resilience of the Australian labour market. In fact, during June and July, as we know, we actually saw the reopening of many parts of the Australian economy. Direct correlation of, with the easing of restrictions is the movement of people back into work. And in those two months, we saw the economy uh, create 340,000 jobs. In fact, in July alone, full-time employment increased by 43,000 500 and part-time employment borrows by 71,200. As Senator Payne knows, this includes almost 60,000 jobs Senator Payne, for women in July and almost 56,000 jobs for young people. And that is why we are focused on job-creating policies and putting in place those economic conditions that businesses Order, can leave Senator off, Cash, create Senator, more jobs time for, for the us. Answers expired. Senator Chisholm. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Sport, Senator Colbeck. The Prime Minister claims his only involvement in the Rorted Community Sport Infrastructure Grants Program was to pass on, and I quote, representations made to us as every Prime Minister has always done. But the Auditor General last night told the Select Committee on Administration of Sports Grants he had never previously seen so much interaction between a Prime Minister's office and the Minister across the entire duration of a grants program. What was the Prime Minister's true involvement in this program? The Minister for Youth and Sport, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, thank the Senator for his question. Order. Uh, Mr President, the, the, the Prime Minister's involvement in the program was, is as he has described it. Senator Chisholm, a supplementary question. Order. Senator Chisholm. You decided you're going to go out with a bang, have you? The ANAO also revealed that then Minister's Office drafted notes for a meeting with the Prime Minister that included, and I quote, how many additional projects in marginal and target seats could be funded? Was the Community Sport Infrastructure Grants Program funding increased to allow the Prime Minister to make more pork barrelling announcements? Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, uh, order. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I, I think it's quite unsurprising that a minister who's looking to promote funding into their portfolio would meet with the Prime Minister proposing to do exactly that, Mr. President. Uh, I've done that a number of times in my portfolios, Mr. President, and uh, the, the record of that uh, is public to. To, to see $1.5 billion into aged care for COVID-19, Mr President. So I think it's, it's quite unsurprising that a minister would go to a meeting with the Prime Minister <coughs> to advocate for additional funding into a program that had received order. significant— Senator Wong, on a point of order. Point of order. The minister is not answering the— Order, Senator Rennick. I hear Senator Wong's point of order. <laughs> I'm happy to sit down for Senator Rennick. Senator <laughs> Tell us, uh, Sorry, it's Thursday. You, I of, of, a, of a week when no one went home, uh, too, I know. So, Senator thank Wong. You, a point of order is uh, on relevance. Uh, the minister is avoiding the question by talking in the abstract. He was asked a very, di very direct question whether or not this program, this program was increased to allow the Prime Minister to make more 
pork barrelling announcements, and I'd ask him to return to the question. Senator Cormann on the point of order. <coughs> thank, <coughs> thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, the minister is being directly relevant to the extent that he can be directly relevant as somebody who was not the minister at the time, who was not the minister at the time. So, I mean, direct relevance has got to be seen in the context of whom is, who is being asked the question, and, <coughs> and Senator, well, Senator Colbeck is answering the question in a directly relevant way to the extent he can, given he was not the minister at the time and was not involved in this process at the time. On the, on, the, on the point of order, the minister was asked about a meeting. It contained, contained somewhat loaded terminology, and I've said before, when there are very specific question-seeking fact, being directly relevant requires a very strict interpretation. Um, when there is more loaded and contested terminology, ministers have more discretion in responding and remaining directly relevant, including challenging the assertions. The minister is being directly relevant, in my view, and I'll call him to continue his answer. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, as I was about to say, uh, Mr. President, this was a very, very popular program, Mr. President. Uh, in the first round, there were over 2,000 applications, Mr. President. And given the popularity of the program, Mr. President, I'm not surprised that the minister, then minister, went back to uh, ERC and the Prime Minister Order, to Colbert, seek additional time funding. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Chisholm, a final supplementary question. Thanks, Mr. President. Given the Prime Minister was clearly able to devote so much time and attention to the rorting of sports grants, where was the time, attention, or colour-coded spreadsheet for aged care? Yeah. Um, that I'm going to, I'll allow the minister. I've long been of the view that ministers should be given the chance to respond to questions um, which contain assertions. I will say that's very difficult. That is getting close to not being a supplementary question, in my view, um, dealing with effectively a different portfolio as well as a. Um, a, a, a and it happens to be the minister's other one, but I've, I've always. I'm not going to rule it out of order. I'm just going to say I think it comes very close to the line. Senator Colbeck will have an opportunity to respond. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. And I really have no choice but to reject the complete premise of the question, Mr. President. Uh, the, decisions, the decisions with respect to uh, sport funding made in the previous parliament, Mr. Question, in the previous parliament, well, uh, Mr. President, the decisions made in the previous parliament. Uh, which, as, uh, which I were not party to, but Mr. President, uh, I believe, uh, and, and from the, the understanding that I have, all the decisions made to increase the funding for this program were appropriately made through the ERC process, uh, and accordingly the, 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 the grant program and the program was administered from there. Senator Seward. And Mr. President, my question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Treasurer Senator Cormann. Um, when asked on, the ABC breakfast, on ABC Breakfast he would bring forward personal tax cuts, Mr Frydenberg said there is one, that is one issue we are considering. We did legislate the tax cuts after the last election. They were in three stages. More money in people's pockets means more spending, and more spending means more jobs. In a recession, why would the government hand out tax cuts and put money in the pockets of millionaires while cutting the coronavirus supplement? when? A higher Order job seeker payment right. is a fail-safe way of stimulating the economy and helping the most vulnerable in our community. Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I can confirm that the government is considering uh, lower taxes for hard-working Australians. That's what we always do, because we understand that providing uh, tax incentives for Australians uh, to work hard and get ahead helps the economy grow, which creates more opportunity for all Australians to get ahead. And we want to create more jobs so that more people can get off welfare back into work. That's what we want to do. The uh, coronavirus supplement uh, was uh, put in place uh, for a six-month uh, period. Uh, at the $550 level. That was always temporary. It was historically unprecedented crisis level support. It is very important now for Australia to move out of the crisis settings uh, into the new normal. And we want to ensure that uh, all Australians have the best possible opportunity to get back into work, to get back into work, which is of course why uh, the policy put forward uh, by Senator Rustin enables those Australians on job seeker to earn more before they lose any of that income support. In fact, uh, Senator Rustin has put forward a policy, which is a very good policy, uh, to increase the amount of uh, income they can, can earn to $300. Uh, dollars. 
three hundred dollars a fortnight, three hundred dollars a fortnight that people can earn instead of one hundred and five dollars a fortnight before they lose any of their any of their job seeker support. We are a government that encourages uh, in, that encourages people to have a goal. We are a government that rewards people that have a goal, and that is how we strengthen the economy and help the economy recover as a result uh, after this coronavirus pandemic. Senator Seward, a supplementary question. Does the, does the minister reject the concept from econ economists that actually giving money to people with low incomes goes into the economy quicker yep. to stimulate the economy, whereas giving money to millionaires, it gets saved? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr uh, President. I, I completely reject this uh, class warfare rhetoric, which was also rejected by the Australian people at the last election. I mean, the, in, in the lead up to the last election, the Greens had somehow captured uh, the, the then leader of the Labor Party into this sort of attack uh, on, uh, on uh, aspirational Australians or those Australians who had done well. We want all Australians to do well, and we want all Australians to have the best possible opportunity to get ahead. We want all Australians to have the best opportunity to get into work, uh, to, get, to pursue a career, and to be the best they can be. We are, we are not going to join you in this sneering approach uh, to policy. Uh, we, 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 are, we are a government that will continue to ensure that the tax policy settings provide an appropriate, appropriately well-targeted safety net for the vulnerable, but also provides the appropriate incentive for people to have a go uh, and do the best they can. Senator C, with a final supplementary question. Minister, what do you say to the 1.8 million people on Job Seeker and Youth Allowance who won't see a cent of tax cuts and are facing their income, a cut in their income of $300 a fortnight? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. The stronger economy that our tax policies will help create will get those people back into work. We want those. We want those Australians to get off income support, off crisis level income support, back into a job. And you know what's happening right now? There are lots of jobs out there. There are lots of jobs out there where businesses can't find anyone to take that job on. That is a terrible situation. Order. And that is why we Senator, need to start making Senator's those adjustments. On my right. That's why we need Senator to start Seward. phasing out uh, the crisis level support that was provided uh, to uh, job seekers in the context of the initial uh, six month period. That is absolutely the right and responsible thing to do because it will help us strengthen the economy, it will help us create more jobs, it will help us ensure that those people, that are, those Australians who are currently on uh, income support, will be able to get uh, a job and uh, look after their family and get ahead. Order, Sen order. Senator, Senator Patrick. Mr. President. I preface, uh, my question is to, is to the Foreign Minister. I preface my question by recalling the remarks of former Foreign Minister Julie Bishop, who, a week out from the 2016 US presidential election, observed that the then candidate Mr Donald Trump was domestically focused and that uh, it would be, I quote, up to our region, including Australia, to persuade a Trump administration to focus on the Asia Pacific. Now that you've been the Foreign Minister for two years, how is that project going? How successful have you and the Prime Minister been in persuading Donald, President Trump to focus positively on our region? How has, the pres has President Trump, Trump's diplomacy helped Australia's interest in the Asia-Pacific? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr President, and I thank Senator Patrick for his question. I think the best way to respond to Senator Patrick uh, is, in fact, to refer to some of the singular outcomes of the 2020 OSMIN meeting held recently uh, in Washington between Secretary of State, Secretary of Defence, Pompeo and Esper, and Minister Reynolds and, uh, and myself. Because the Indo-Pacific was the principal topic of our discussion in Washington, Mr. President, we reached agreement on a wide range of issues. And let me start just with the deployment of an affordable, safe, and effective COVID-19 vaccine, if one is achieved, and therapeutics to the Indo-Pacific region. What that builds on, <clears throat> what that builds on, Mr. President, is early U.S. support with Australia and New Zealand for the distribution of key medical and health supplies through the, from Suva to the Pacific uh, at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. We agreed our global health security statement, which will also help us build Indo-Pacific partner capacity in biosecurity, in biosafety and in biosurveillance to prevent, detect and respond to infectious disease outbreaks. 
and importantly, to reduce the risk of future pandemics, we agreed to establish a new working group between the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and the Department of State to monitor disinformation efforts, to counter state-sponsored and other malicious disinformation and interference. In terms of supporting the economic recovery in the region, we focused on the development of high-quality infrastructure investments, particularly through the Trilateral Infrastructure Partnership uh, and other mechanisms, including the Papua New Guinea Electrification Partnership uh, and also the proposed undersea cable for, for Palau with other partners, including, as I've said, Japan. We're looking at ways to mobilise private sector investment in the Indo-Pacific to deliver high-quality infrastructure and natural resource projects. When you meet Adam Bowler, the head of the uh, DFC, the Development Finance Corporation in the United States, you absolutely know how focused the administration is on those high-quality infrastructure projects Order. in the Pacific Senator and in Payne. Southeast Asia. Time for the answers expired. Senator Patrick, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. In the run-up to this year's U.S. election. What positive efforts have you and the Australian Ambassador in Washington made to engage directly with Democratic presidential candidate Joe Biden's foreign policy team? What discussions have you or Ambassador Sinodinos had with Mr Biden's senior foreign policy advisers, for example, former Deputy Secretary of State uh, uh, Tony Blinken or former Deputy National Security Adviser to the Vice President and East Asia expert Ellie Ratner? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Patrick for his supplementary. Uh, can I start, Mr. President, by saying what an exceptional job former Senator Sinodinos is doing as Australia's ambassador in the United States, dealing with the significant challenges that COVID-19 brings, both to the operational aspects of an embassy, particularly a large embassy like that in Washington, but importantly, the significant challenges it brings to the management of any bilateral relationship and those engagement issues. Senator, uh, Ambassador Sinodinos has been exceptional in his outreach across Washington, uh, and I see that in every interaction I have and every engagement I have. Uh, Senator Patrick, it would not usually be the case that a uh, minister would uh, canvass in public discussions had with. Uh, uh, with uh, representatives uh, across the political uh, sphere in any country. Uh, but I can say, uh, Senator, that uh, on my previous visit to Washington just in March of this year, I know that a uh, number of those uh, mentioned in Senator Patrick's question participated in a very diverse roundtable Order. discussion with foreign Senator policy Payne, experts, and I particularly appreciated their insights. Expired. Senator Patrick, a final supplementary. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Joe Biden's former uh, foreign policy platform says that he aims to, quote, uh, to win the competition for the future against China. Mr Biden's East Asia adviser, Mr Ratner, wants Australia to increase defence spending to help blunt China's regional power. How do you think a Biden administration will deal with China? How might that differ from President Trump? And what do you expect a Biden administration will ask of Australia? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I thank Senator Patrick for his question. Uh, I think uh, no matter from whom any exhortation to Australia comes in terms of defence spending, we have a very, very significant reply, and it's called the Defence Strategic Update. Secondly, I would say that the United States' relationship with China and vice versa is a matter, of course, for each of those countries, not for Australia. Uh, and it's a matter for any US administration, no matter who is the elected US administration. What I would say, though, Mr. President, in relation to the Indo-Pacific, the Indo-Pacific is where we both live, the United States and Australia. It's the home of our greatest responsibilities. It's the home of our most compelling priorities. And what we do, our work through OSMIN and our bilateral relationship, is all about making the most meaningful contributions we can to foster a better Indo-Pacific, an Indo-Pacific that is open and secure and prosperous and based on the rule of law. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the Morrison government is guaranteeing essential services and ensuring people with disability have equal opportunities on our road to economic recovery? Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank Senator Chandler for her question. Um, the government is absolutely committed to ensuring that people that live with disability are included in all aspects of community and also making sure that we provide them with the equal opportunity that they deserve. We recognise that part of that has got to be making sure that we are well informed about um, the requirements of people with disability, and that's why research funding is so important in achieving understanding as well as being able to achieve good outcomes. 
And that's why we recently announced a partnership with, uh, with the Melbourne University Disability, Uni uh, Melbourne Disability Institute at the Melbourne University of Melbourne, uh, a national disability research partnership. The government is providing $2.5 million uh, in seed funding to establish this partnership, which will focus on disability and mainstream services, including such things as health, education, housing and justice. So over the next two years, this partnership will prepare and progress a research agenda, a research capability roadmap and practical guides for disability-inclusive research into partnerships with the disability community. We recognise that data and evidence is absolutely essential when it comes to developing uh, good policy and evidence-based policy. And that's why we provided a further $15 million uh, to make sure that we can de develop a national disability data asset. This asset will help governments across the whole country, as well as policymakers, understand how people with disability are supported through services, through payments and through programs across the multiple levels of services and service systems that exist within this country at many levels, including state and federal. And through the sharing of this de-identified data through the data asset will allow governments to better understand the life experiences and outcomes for people with disability. We believe that this is an essential part of developing an, an inclusive uh, and equal opportunity for all Australians, including those with disability. Order. Senator Chandler, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister update the Senate on how the government is supporting scholarship opportunities for regional and remote Australians with disability? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, clearly, um, you know, getting a job and keeping a job is an absolute game changer for anybody, no matter where they live or who they are in this country. And it shouldn't be any different for somebody who lives with a disability. And that's why we have partnered with the ABC to showcase the incredible work of our up-and-coming um, content makers uh, who live with disability, and to help increase the employment opportunities for those people. Uh, this program is now in its third year, um, and the program, Regional St uh, Storyteller Scholarship, offers $60,000 worth of funding to provide opportunities for regional Australians with disability to undertake a scholarship with the ABC. Um, this scholarship provides opportunities um, for people to further their career aspirations in content making um, and allowing them to showcase their skills and experience through a wide range of avenues that are offered through the ABC. Uh, and can I take this opportunity to congratulate this year's scholarship winners who were announced in June, and I'd encourage anybody who wants to be part of it to, to apply for next year. Order. Senator Chandler, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister update the Senate on the government's plans for a new national disability strategy? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Well, the, the next national disability strategy will be set, uh, laid out by governments across Australia about how we can work together, state and territory and federal government, to make the lives of people with disability as best as we possibly can. So we're working with the states and territories on the new strategy, uh, and I recently released a, a position paper which has kicked off the second stage of the consultations. The position paper outlines the key features that we are proposing to include in the new strategy and is informed by the previous strategy uh, and the successes and the, some of the not successes of the previous strategy. We are inviting all Australians, whether they live with disability, have experienced dis with disability or whether they don't, to have their say in this position paper because we want to make sure that the next national disability strategy, as is informed as it possibly can be, to make sure that it provides uh, the support and the, and the initiatives for people who live with disability uh, and to make sure that our next strategy Order is the best Senator strategy Rustin, it can be. Senator McAllister. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Yesterday, the minister claimed, and I quote, we have to put the incentives back in place so people can start engaging with the job market. Given there are 13 job seekers for every one job vacancy, what jobs does she want the one million unemployed Australians to engage with? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator McAllister for her question. Um, well, quite clearly, Senator McAllister, the decision that was made by this government and announced in the July economic financial update uh, for the extension of a number of measures, whether it be the JobKeeper extension or whether it be the extension of, of uh, the coronavirus um, supplement, recognise the fact that we understand that the job market is still very, very shallow. 
That is not to say that the jobs market has not improved and, and it continues to improve with new jobs being created, but I will absolutely agree that the jobs market in Australia remains very shallow, and it's particularly evident in a state like Victoria, uh, where the vi and, and I have to say acknowledge the Victorian economy and the people of Victoria are going through an extremely difficult time with the stage four lockdowns having a massive impact on their economy, but also on the livelihoods and the well-being of people who live in Victoria. Victoria. But notwithstanding that, Senator McAllister, through you, Mr Chair, um, the rest of Australia, seven out of the eight uh, states and territories of Australia, are starting to see their economies open up as restrictions are lifted, and hopefully we'll see the restrictions lifted even further, and we will start seeing um, the jobs that we, uh, that we want to see return to the economy come back again. But we as a government remain committed to have elevated levels of support for people across the whole of the economy going forward. These announcements have already been made in recognition of the fact of the circumstances that are before us at the moment. But we do, and we make no apology for saying to people who find themselves unemployed, we want you to start engaging with the jobs market. We want you to start understanding um, you know, what opportunities might be out there at the moment. There are areas in our economy where we are seeing significant new jobs being created. And I think Senator Cash actually pointed out a minute ago Order. about the number of jobs that Order have been created over recent times. And we Order. will continue to support the on Australian people through this pandemic. Senator McAllister, a supplementary question. Thank you. The same day the national accounts showed the biggest quarterly contraction on record, household consumption plummeting and business investment tanking, the minister claimed, and I quote, across much of the economy, we are starting to see the green shoots. Can the minister explain to the one million unemployed Australians and the 400,000 Australians expected to lose their jobs by Christmas where to find these green shoots? Senator Rustin. Well, look, um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. And I'd just like to point out that, that the, the basis of the question that has been put forward, that the accounts that were pre uh, presented yesterday, reflected the economic conditions that followed the shutdown of the Australian economy in March, following the states and territories' decision to shut down borders, close down their economies. And yesterday, our national accounts reflected that. And I don't think there's anybody in this place that would disagree with the fact that the results that we saw yesterday were, had, had, had a devastating impact on the Australian economy and the lives and livelihoods of many in it. But to suggest that, the, that there are not the opportunities starting to, starting to open up in our economy, the jobs figures that were quoted a minute ago by the minister who has responsibility for employment, Senator Cash, saying that there are jobs coming back into the market. What we as a government want is we want people to actually realise that we are doing everything we can to Order. make sure Senator jobs Rustin, are created. Senator time for the answers expired. Senator McAllister, a final supplementary. Thanks, Mr President. Australians are living through the worst economic recession since the Great Depression, wages are declining and 600,000 Australians have been forced to drain their super completely. Why is the minister telling unemployed Australians to engage with jobs that don't exist while refusing to use her power to maintain support and cutting back payments for the 1.5 million Australians relying on them? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, I mean, I, I think Senator, um, Senator McAllister obviously clearly hasn't listened to, to what I have been saying. I have not denied that the jobs market is very shallow. I have merely suggested that the people who find themselves unemployed um, should be, especially in the states and territories where we are seeing job creation starting to come back online, that they should be starting to, to engage with the jobs market to see if there are jobs out there that are available to them. And to continue to perpetuate this myth about us making cuts, I would reaffirm to you we have continued the support that we have had in place by extending the coronavirus supplement past the end of September. And in fact, I'll acknowledge that even Senator, uh, Senator Gallagher said um, you know, we argued for it to be extended and it has been extended. I mean, those opposite obviously acknowledge the fact that we have extended the supplement. And now to come into this place and to say otherwise, I'm not quite sure what you actually want. Order. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Can the minister outline how the Morrison government is keeping Australians safe 
by ensuring the Australian Army has the firepower, mobility and protection it needs on the modern battlefield. The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Henderson not only for her question but for her passion and her relentless commitment to defence industry in Victoria. Uh, Mr President, the first role of this government, and indeed any government, is to keep Australia and also Australians safe. That's why this government is investing $270 billion over the next decade into upgrading our defence capabilities, and this includes $55 billion into new land capabilities. This will ensure our land forces have greater lethality, greater range, greater mobility and, most importantly, greater survivability for our troops. We must equip our army to deter potential adversaries in our region and also be able to respond with credible force. That's why this government is investing in strike weapons, watercraft, helicopters, armoured fighting vehicles, logistic capabilities and also emerging robotics and autonomous systems. Our region's challenging environment also demands that our army can fight across a range of different domains and a range of regions. Thanks to this coalition government, the ADF now has an outstanding amphibious capability centred on our two magnificent Canberra-class LHDs. Larger and more capable Army watercraft will support rapid regional deployment of ADF land capabilities, and they will be capable of independent and also task force operations. These investments and the many more that we've outlined in the force structure plan are essential to our nation and they're essential to Australia maintaining our capability edge. Senator Henderson, a supplementary question. Can the minister provide an update to the Senate on the self-propelled Howitzer project and how this project is supporting jobs in my home state of Victoria and the great city of Geelong? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thanks, Mr. Mr. President, and again, thanks, Senator Henderson, for that great enthusiasm for, for the Greater Geelong region. Uh, Mr. President, today I was pleased to announce that Defence will shortly release a request for tender to Hanwha Defence Australia to build and also to sustain, over the longer term, 30 self-propelled howitzers in Geelong. This is an important next step in progressing the Morrison's government 2019 election commitment to provide this essential capability for Army. This will create up to 350 jobs. And by reviving this project that Labor so scandalously cancelled, this government is ensuring our Army has the combat power it needs. It is this Morrison government that is ensuring Australian industry involvement in the delivery of this capability over the next decade. And that means jobs for Australians. Senator Henderson, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister provide an update to the Senate on the Hawkeye project and how this project is also supporting jobs in my home state of Victoria and the great city of Bendigo? Senator Reynolds. Well, we've got the trifecta. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, the great passion for Senator Henderson for Bendigo as well. But today, uh, Mr. President, I also announced that the ADF's new Australian-designed and Australian-built Hawkeye light protected mobility vehicle will enter full rate production, that is 50 vehicles per month. Hawkeye production by Talus Australia will sustain over 200 jobs in Bendigo and uh, an additional 180 nationwide. But most importantly, the Hawkeye will again better protect the lives of our Australian soldiers. Hawkeye has provided vital business continuity for many small businesses in Victoria, and particularly important uh, during this time as Victoria deals with the COVID-19 outbreak. And Mr. President, this is yet another wonderful example of defence and Australian industry managing business practices in a COVID-safe environment so we can continue to deliver Order. Australian ADF capability. Senator O'Neill. Very much, uh, Mr. President, and my question, without notice, is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australian Senator Colbeck. News Corp paper, newspapers revealed in reports this morning that more than 100 older Australians are being raped, assaulted, and even murdered in this minister's aged care system every week, with more than 50,000 
incidences of assault and abuse going unreported each year. Advocacy group Aged Care Crisis has found, and I quote, aged care residents in nursing homes have been raped, robbed, bathed in kerosene, attacked by rodents, suffering injuries or death from other residents, burnt to death, strangled, cooked, melted, sedated to death, over-medicated or choked to death. Is the minister going to ignore these warnings? The Minister for Senior Australians in Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank um, the Senator for the question. Uh, and the government isn't and hasn't been ignoring those warnings. In fact, uh, this government has continued to act to reform the aged care sector, in, including, Mr. President, the calling of the Royal Commission, which is currently investigating in a forensic manner the aged care sector, Mr. President. But while the Royal Commission's being undertaken, we have continued to act to reform the aged care sector, Mr. President. So, uh, beginning from the last, be, beginning from uh, July last year, we've had the new aged care quality standards that we've put in place, Mr. President. We've instituted a new charter of rights for residents in residential aged care. Uh, we've completed the legislative process to bring together the aged care quality safety commission as one entity, and uh, that entity began its work as a single entity on the first of. January this year, Mr. President. So we have continued to act in a reform sense, uh, as this, uh, as the Royal Commission has continued. And in, in respect of the story in the media this morning, I mean those things are clearly unacceptable, clearly unacceptable. And that's why, Mr. President, we've uh, progressed the work on the Serious Incident Response Scheme. And in, in and in that Serious Incident Response Scheme, we've incorporated some things that didn't exist previously, including resident-on-resident -resident attacks, which a lot of these uh, uh, issues that were reported this morning are, Mr. President. We've, in, we've included home care into the Serious Incident Response Scheme, Mr. President, and we actually brought forward the funding instead of waiting until the budget in October this year. We announced the funding for the progression of the Serious Incident Response, response Scheme in June this year because we understand that it's an important uh, piece of work and we wanted to make sure that it was being progressed, Mr. President. So not only do we recognise these issues, we understand that they're not acceptable, but we continue to reform the sector to improve the outcomes for residents in residential Order. aged care and uh, aged care across Senator the sector. O'Neill, a supplementary question. I have question. to say reform hasn't been going too well so far. The CEO of Payne Australia quit the Morrison government's Aged Care Quality Advisory Council because she found, and I quote, the focus was not about quality at all, and it just really fell short of the mark. Why do older Australians have to suffer the consequences of a minister who keeps falling short of the mark? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the individual that uh, is mentioned by uh, the senator actually, as I understand it, resigned from the previous incarnation of the Quality uh, Advisory Councils over two years ago. Mr. President, uh, there is a new Quality Council in place now, under a, under a new framework, Mr. President, uh, and it is operating quite differently, Mr. President. So uh, it's, it's, all, it's all very well. It's all very well for uh, Senator to bring up historical Order. events, but Mr. President, as I said in my Previous answer. We have continued to reform this sector. Uh, the, the new Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission, which commenced in its new form on the 1st of January this year, is operating in a different way. We are providing additional powers, and, those, and some of those powers have occurred during, uh, uh, during the, the COVID-19 outbreak, Mr. President. And we continue to look and work with the Quality and Safety Advisory Council on what additional powers might be required for the commissioner to utilise. Senator O'Neill, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. As a result of the horrific reality of the minister's aged care system, including ants crawling in wounds, loved ones left abandoned for hours, and families, families who've lost mothers, fathers, grandmas, granddads, the Senate has actually censured the minister. When will a minister resign? and give his portfolio to someone who won't fall short of the mark and might be capable of getting it right. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. What I will continue to do and what the government will continue to do is the work that we have been doing in reforming and improving the aged care sector in this country. And Mr President, had the, minute, had the Senator 
listen to the answers that I gave to the first two answers, she would understand that that work a has been going, has been occurring, and continues to occur. And not only that, Mr. President, we we act with with appropriate urgency to ensure that these reforms continue. And Mr. President, it was this government that called the Royal Commission into uh, into aged care. Mr. President, uh, there's been members on the other side trotting around the place saying that they supported it when they didn't. In fact, they called into doubt whether we actually needed a an aged care royal commission, Mr. President. So this government has and continues to act while the royal commission continues to reform the sector to improve it, so that senior Australians get the care that they deserve in residential home, uh, care and in home care. Senator McMahon. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the minister for the environment, Senator Birmingham. Can the minister please update the Senate on how the Morrison government is investing in Australia's national parks to provide short-term economic stimulus that leaves long-term environmental and economic benefit to industries such as tourism? The minister representing the Minister for the Environment, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. I thank, uh, I thank Senator McMahon for her question. And indeed, our government is investing a record $233 million dollars in Commonwealth National Parks to maintain their status as global icons of Australia, but importantly to drive and create job opportunities, especially in the Northern Territory, where indeed our iconic national parks primarily sit. $233 million being funded over three years to support specific projects across Uluru Katajuka National Park, Kakadu, Booderee and Christmas Island National Parks, as well as the Australian National Botanic Gardens. These parks are internationally renowned, especially those in the Northern Territory, as key tourism, cultural and ecological destinations. The funding Mr. President, will support critical growth and employment with the creation of over 1,100 jobs in regional and remote areas as a result of this investment and work. It will be vital economic stimulus for those communities, providing an opportunity for our national parks, together with local industry and communities, to be revitalised following the COVID-19 pandemic, to ensure that we invest in their strong recovery, to encourage strong tourism visitation to those regions once international travel is available again, to help drive the tourism businesses and regional re economies there to recover strongly from the heavy impacts. The investment is in addition to the $216 million already committed to growing tourism in Kakadu National Park and the waiving of park entry fees that our government introduced. The work involved will provide some 1,114 estimated jobs, some 564 during the construction phase, a further 550 indirect jobs in manufacturing, hospitality and transport businesses. We recognise that these parks form the lifeblood of many communities, the lifeblood of the tourism industry in the Northern Territory, and that's why we are investing that to support the industry and support the Territory Order. through these tough Senator times. Birmingham. Senator McMahon, a supplementary question. Wonderful news indeed, Minister. How does this investment, investment complement other support being provided to Territorians in my Northern Territory? Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, sir. thanks, Mr. President. Indeed, uh, our support for the Northern Territory uh, is strong in delivering, in delivering the support for the national parks through the JobKeeper and JobSeeker program. We're supporting, indeed, through JobKeeper, more than 5,000 organisations in the Northern Territory have received more than $200 million in support and funding to sustain jobs and employment during the pandemic. Our government has also provided support to individuals and households, and indeed the business support, seeing more than $180 million paid out in credits across the Territory. Our freight assistance mechanism has helped the Territory by establishing an air bridge between Darwin and Brisbane that can enable necessary freight and be that mud crabs heading into Asia or soon into the mango season, we will see territory produce headed from Darwin to Brisbane and then onto flights across the region and out into the world, sustaining jobs and export for Territorians and the Territory. Order. Senator McMahon, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Minister, it's, it's great to hear that we will be able to have our mango daiquiris. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Minister, how important is tourism to jobs in Australia? Senator Birmingham. 
Mr. Mr. President, around one in 13 Australian jobs depended upon our tourism and hospitality sectors as we head into the pandemic. And sadly, many of those businesses, many of those jobs have been unavoidable victims of shutdowns and restrictions across the country. But their potential recovery is being hampered and impeded by the disproportionate maintenance of blanket border restrictions across the country. Mr. President, let me acknowledge, though, the wise words of Mr. Albanese on this, uh, on this topic. Back at the time of the uh, back at the time of uh, debate about Virgin Australia, he said hundreds of thousands employed in the tourism sector depend upon a viable two airline industry as an essential component of an effective tourism industry in Australia. Well, Mr. President, what else do you need for a viable tourism industry? You need routes that planes can fly on and states that people can travel between. And Mr President, I would now urge Mr Albanese to lend his voice to support. Don't just leave it to Paul Keating. Don't Order. leave it to Paul Senator Keating Birmingham, to stand up for the tourism time for the answer has expired. Let Mr Albanese Senator Birmingham, time for the answer has expired. Order. Only a few minutes to go, everyone. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australian, Senator Colbeck. In June, the Minister announced a serious incident report scheme would be operational in 2021. In fact, today in question time, the Minister referenced this announcement as an example of his actions. Can the Minister confirm the establishment of this scheme will be four years? four years after it was first recommended in 2017. Can the minister explain to the Senate why he and the Morrison government have taken four years to heed the warnings of the Elder Abuse, a National Legal Response Report, and establish the scheme? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australian, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, the, point, the point that I made earlier in question time was that uh, rather than wait until the budget for the announcement of funding for uh, the Serious Incident Response Scheme, uh, my initiative and my imperative, Mr. President, was to ensure that that work could commence immediately, immediately, Mr. President. So, Mr. President, that's why, when I had the opportunity to ensure that this funding was available, $23 million for the implementation of the Serious Incident Response Scheme, uh, I took the opportunity to ensure that occurred, Mr. President. As uh, I said in my answer to a previous question today, the, the incidents that we've seen, the incidents that have occurred, uh, are not acceptable, Mr. President. They're not acceptable, and that's why we've incorporated into the serious incident response scheme uh, uh, resident-on-resident assaults, which previously hadn't been part of the program, Mr. President. Order. And that's Senator why Wong we've on expanded it. Uh, Mr. President, this I've raised a point of order, direct relevance. The question went to why it's taken four years. Um, the question was quite lengthy, Senator Wong. I think the minister talking about the activity he claims to have undertaken is directly relevant to. I'm, I'm, excuse me. I'm, I, I try from the chair to use non-pejorative phrases on questions and answers. Um, he is being directly relevant, um, talking about his program of work and activity, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. And so, so, so my action was to make sure that this funding was available quickly. That it was uh, available to continue the scheme. It was to ensure that, Mr. President, that uh, uh, resident-on-resident uh, incidents were included in the scheme, and, Mr. President, also to ensure that uh, the scheme covered home care, which it didn't previously, Mr. President. So we have, I have. Uh, all through my time in this portfolio, put this as one of the important things that I wanted to ensure that we achieve. Uh, and so I made sure that the funding was available uh, and announced in June rather than waiting until the budget came down in October. Uh, and I will continue to pursue this as an important measure for the government and for those who are residing in, a, in residential aged care, but also, Mr. President, importantly, those who are receiving home care services. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. This minister has ignored the 2018 Aged Care work Workforce Strategy, the 2019 Aged Care Royal Commission Interim Report entitled Neglect, Warnings from the Northern Hemisphere, 
warnings from experts and unions, warnings from Dorothy Henderson Lodge in March and Newmarch House in April. Isn't the 2017 Elder Abuse a National Legal Response Report just another warning this minister has ignored? Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, and I completely reject the premise of Senator Wong's question. Uh, we have, this government has continued to act to progress the interests of residents in aged care across the country. Uh, we called the Royal Commission uh, Mr. President, into residential aged care because we wanted a forensic investigation of the entire residential aged care sector. And, Mr. President, we have continued to reform the sector while the Royal Commission was being, is being conducted, uh, despite the Royal Commission saying that they didn't want to be investigating a moving target, Mr. President. So we've continued the important reforms, important reforms like the Serious Incident Response Scheme, important reforms like the new code of conduct for residential aged care uh, residents, that like the new quality standards for uh, residential aged age care across the board, and including the creation of the new Aged Care and Quality Safety Commission. So, Mr. President, I have and this government has continued to reform this sector while the Royal Commission is doing its Order. work, and we look Senator forward Colbeck. to its reporting Senator February Wong, next year. Final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. This minister has ignored warning after warning, failed to plan, failed to act urgently, and as a result, he has lost the confidence of the Australian people and the confidence of the Senate. Today in the House of Representatives, Mr Morrison, the Prime Minister, couldn't bring himself to express confidence in this minister. So I ask this minister, when will you resign? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Again, I reject the premise of Senator Wong's question. Uh, and what I will do is what I've said I will do in previous questions uh, during question time today. I will continue to work in the interests of senior Australians. I will continue to, in, to bring reforms forward to government, as, I've, as I have done during my tenure, and, and I will continue to uh, in, uh, work to ensure that senior Australians, through the COVID-19 uh, COVID pandemic, have access to the resources uh, and the support that they need, Mr President, uh, in, uh, in, in ensuring that they get an appropriate level of care throughout uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And Mr. President, $1.5 billion as a result of my interventions and work with the ERC and the government is a clear demonstration of the fact that I take this role seriously and I will continue to do just that. Senator Cormann. I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. Thanks. Um, colleagues, I'd like to make two statements now that question time has concluded. First, touch wood, now that we have successfully delivered our first night first fortnight of remote participation, I would like to acknowledge the efforts of people across DPS who designed, delivered and supported the system that has enabled this to be a success, building on the work undertaken that has seen more than 100 committee hearings with active video conference facilities since April. This has involved delivering not just the technical aspects but also direct contact with participating senators to ensure they were equipped and prepared ahead of this sitting period and troubleshooting technical issues as they arose. The, length, the list of people involved is lengthy, so I'll identify just some of the key people led by DPS branch heads Cons Firas and Christine White. From ICT, James Lawson, Gary Asbert, Liz Lawrence, Michael York, Chris Williams and Tim Ryan. From Parliamentary Broadcasting, Michael Ferguson and Matthew Burke. Um, on behalf of the Senate, I thank you. Second, I need to make a statement relating to security management in the building, and it corresponds to a similar statement made by the Speaker at the end of the June sittings. The electronic access control system is currently in the process of being activated on the Senate side of Parliament House. In common terms, this refers to the new swipe cards that replace keys to access your suites. The rollout of this project predates my time as president as part of the suite of security upgrades undertaken across the building over several years. I have always and continue to appreciate the sensitivity senators have, regard, have regarding access control and associated data records and management, so I'm making this statement to the Senate. Accordingly, I ensured that extensive consultation has been undertaken prior to activation. The Speaker and I have now formally approved and enacted the Electronic Access System Code of Practice, which governs the management of this system, including its associated data. Prior to my approval of this policy, it was considered and approved by the Senate Committee on Appropriations, Staffing and Security. As a condition of that approval, I agreed to make this statement to the Senate. First, the specific focus of all usage of the EACS and EACS data is for the purposes of security, safety and law enforcement. 
One of the key purposes of the Code of Practice is to function as a safeguard for parliamentarians against the possibility that the EAC system or its data may be used in a manner which improperly interferes with the functions and authority of the Senate or with the free performance by senators of their parliamentary duties. In this regard, the administration of the EAC and the powers given to officers under the Code of Practice have effect only subject to the powers, privileges and immunities of the Houses and their members. These protections are appropriately spelled out in the text of the Code. Second, that while changes to the EAC's Code of Practice must be approved by the presiding officers, that is the Speaker and myself, I will not make any change without consultation with the Senate Standing Committee on Appropriations, Staffing and Security, unless required as a matter of urgency, when in such an instance it will be reported to that committee as soon as possible. Finally, the Code of Practice includes a requirement that the Code itself and compliance with it will be reviewed at least every two years by an independent and suitably qualified person appointed by the Assistant Secretary, Security Branch, in consultation with the Security Management Board of Parliament House. This process has taken several years. As I said, I inherited it upon taking office in November 2017, and I would like to thank the many senators and officials who have assisted in finalising this code, including former Senator Collins, Senator O'Neill, but particularly Senator McAllister, who has worked extensively and consulted extensively, reflecting senators' concerns over the last 10 months. So a personal thank you as well. Senator O'Neill. Yes, I, uh, I seek leave to make a short statement. In response leave. to your statement, President. Leave is granted. Thank you. I wish to make some brief comments as the Chair of the Committee of Privileges, which I have agreed with Senator Abetz, the Deputy Chair of the Committee. I note with thanks the President's statement about the electronic access control system today, and I applaud his work with Senators of the Committee on Procedure to settle this matter, this contentious matter. This new technology will necessarily disrupt and displace older ways of ensuring the security and safety of the people who work in this place in service of the Australian people, our practices and the information we hold. You will no doubt, Mr President, recall the interest of the Committee of Privileges in the EAX system, security systems and practices, and new digital modes of working, including their management and oversight. Our particular interest is driven by our determination to ensure parliamentary privilege is protected in ways that adapt to the realities of these digital days. The committee has taken a close and active interest in negotiations to update the memorandum of understanding on the execution of search warrants in the premises of members of parliament and the associated AFP national guideline for the execution of search warrants where parliamentary privilege may be involved. In the 45th Parliament, the committee considered two matters relating to the disposition of material over which a claim of privilege had been made. In both matters, the material had been seized under search warrants executed by the AFP. The first matter related to the NPN Co papers and the second related to a claim of privilege made by Senator Pratt. In both matters, the committee concluded that the claim of privilege should be upheld and recommended to the Senate that the seized materials be withheld from the AFP investigation. The Senate adopted those recommendations. In the wake of these matters in 2018, the Senate called on the Attorney General as a matter of urgency to work with the presiding officers to develop a new protocol for the execution of search warrants and the use by executive agencies of other intrusive powers. The Senate noted the new protocol should comply with the principles and address the shortcomings identified in reports tabled in the 45th Parliament by the Senate Committee of Privileges and the House of Representatives, Committee of Privileges and Members' Interest. Compliance with the MOU and the associated AFP national guideline is intended to ensure the exercise of investigative powers does not improperly interfere with the parliament, parliamentary committees or parliamentarians freely performing their functions. However, it is clear from the committee's work over recent years that there is confusion about the scope of parliamentary privilege. In particular, there appears to be limited awareness that the powers to punish contempts may be invoked where the exercise of an investigative power amounts to an improper interference with the functions of the parliament. More practically, the MOU and the guidelines fo guideline focus on the execution of search warrants on physical premises occupied or used by a member of the parliament. Increasingly, the investigative powers of law enforcement officers, which have the potential to intrude on parliamentary privilege, include powers to access telecommunications data and other electronic data relating to parliamentarians or their staff. In June, 
The committee agreed to draft guiding principles to facilitate the renegotiation of the MOU and the guideline and, uh, and, the guideline, and provided these to the president and the senators, other senators. The changes proposed by the committee are aimed at updating the MOU and the guidelines so they continue to fulfil their purpose of protecting the ability of the houses their members and committees to exercise their authority and perform their duties without undue external influence. However, the committee is also conscious that the MOU and the guideline must recognise the legitimate interest of law enforcement against illegal activity. These protocols must not inadvertently shield, provide a shield to illegal activity. I note, Mr President, that work is underway. This progress is encouraging, but this is a matter that the Senate first called for action on in 2018. I hoped that revised protocols, which ensure that the exercise of investigative powers does not improperly imp interfere with the parliament, parliament freely performing its functions, can be quickly concluded. Indeed, I might even put it on my Christmas list, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you, Sen Senator Cormann. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, I seek leave to move a motion to vary the routine of business for the remainder of today. So they granted. Leave is granted. Senator Cormann. Uh, I move the motion as circulated and move that the motion be now put without amendment or debate. The question is the motion be put. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The question now is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion to amend the routine of business. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Yes, Senator McKim. Uh, President, I'd just ask that the Australian Greens opposition to this motion be noted. So noted. Thank you, Senator McKim. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I seek um, leave of the Senate uh, to move um, motion number 792 from the notice paper that we didn't get to earlier is today. Leave, granted? leave is granted. Oh, Senator, Senator Gallagher. Thank you. I seek leave to amend general business notice of motion number 792. Is leave granted? Leave is granted, Senator Gallagher. Thank you. And I amend the motion in the terms circulated in the chamber, and I move the motion. Question. Senator Cormann. I seek leave to make a brief uh, statement. Leave is granted. That the Australian Aboriginal flag is a powerful and respected symbol for all Australians. That the Australian government is aware of the concerns around the copyright of the Aboriginal flag, and would like to see a resolution to this uh, issue in a way that respects the rights of the flag's creator while ensuring the flag continues to be a powerful symbol of unity for Aboriginal people. It is a delicate and sensitive issue, and the government respects the copyright of Mr Thomas and the interests of all parties. We do not want to see the process currently underway jeopardised. It is important to note that the Australian Aboriginal flag can be flown freely, as per the intention of copyright holder Mr Thomas. The question is the motion moved by Senator Gallagher as amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. We'll now re return to the routine of business, which is motions to take note. Just before I ask if there are notice uh, motions to take note, I remind senators this will uh, finish at 3:30. Senator Polly. Thank you. I rise to take note of answers given by Senator Rustin to questions asked by Senator Gallagher and McAllister. Well, what an extraordinary question time we had today. It seems to be that there's a cancer in this government, and that is they just don't want to pay attention to what's happening in the community. There is no accountability, and there certainly is no responsibility. Australia's economy fell by 7 per cent in the June quarter, making it the first recession in almost three decades. Not only that, that we are now in the deepest recession that Australia has experienced since the Great Depression. And yet we have a minister who can't seem to do her maths when there's a reduction to the job seeker payment from five hundred dollars down to and a loss of five hundred dollars down to three hundred dollars, and she doesn't see that as a loss. Well there's there's a lot of Australians out looking for work before we had this pandemic and now the economic circumstances. A million Australians are out there looking for work. In Australia, the figures, there's one job for 13 people trying to get that job. In Tasmania, my home state, 
It's at least 15 people applying for that one job. And the minister says, and I quote, but across much of the economy, we are starting to see green shoots of our economy opening up. We are starting to see jobs occur. Well, I don't know where she's been lately, because I can tell you one thing for sure. In Tasmania, we're looking at losing a lot more jobs, a lot more jobs. And we know, because all the reports are telling us, that we can expect another 400,000 Australians by Christmas are going to have lost their jobs. Now, we've seen time after time across the last few months businesses, small businesses, closing their door but failing to be able to reopen. We have a situation where we have a government that is great at making announcements. They love the photo op, but they just don't deliver. And we've seen that again today, when a minister stands up and tries to tell us, oh, look, it's all OK, it's all OK, it'll be right, mate, it's going to snap back. Well, the reality is, in the real world, when you go out and talk to real Australians, you will understand that people are doing it very, very tough, and it's only going to get worse. Now, I was reprimanded today because I did uh, hold up and I said, well, here you are, here's the government's plan, the jobs plan. There is no plan, and unless we have a plan, unless this government can somehow get the ability to put together a jobs plan, things are going to be very bleak for our economy for some time to come. Now, to say, as the leader of the government in this uh, place said today during question time, that there's jobs out there, there's a lot of jobs out there, well, please tell us where all those jobs are so I can tell my fellow Australians that are either unemployed or underemployed, we have in excess of 30,000 Tasmanians that are either unemployed now or underemployed. We've got businesses, restaurants, cafes, hotels, clubs. The list goes on of businesses that are doing it really, really tough. Now, we've got two Economy is running at the moment in my home state. We've got the businesses that rely on locals to support them. And they're saying, you know, everything is going along as well as can be expected. But they're not putting on as many people um, as they did previously. And then we've got the industries around tourism and others that actually rely on not only national visitors coming to our home state, but also um, international visitors. So to say that we've got green shoots, I'd just like to remind you, Minister, what's really happening is the vines are withering and they're dying. And with that comes a lot more disadvantage, social issues that are going to impact on our communities. Now, a bleak Christmas for, in addition to the one million unemployed Australians, now there's going to be 400 thousand additional people unemployed. Now, when we sing um, off the hymn sheets that we've seen over the last uh, two weeks that we've been sitting in the Senate and talking about how good they've been with job seeker and job keeper, there are many in our communities who have been left behind. And when the Prime Minister used to refer to when, at the start of this pandemic that we're all in this together, that didn't last very long because what he's doing is he's leaving people behind leaving people behind, and it's unacceptable. Thank you, Senator Polly. Your time has expired. Senator Van. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Um, I rise to take note of the minister's answers as well. And it's been one thing to see that Australia is entering into its first recession in 29 years, a remarkable, remarkable event in and of itself. And the amount of growth that's happened in the Australian economy, especially over the last seven years, all comes down to the coalition government. Now, we entered into this recession, a recession that I remind senators <clears throat> is caused entirely by the COVID-19 pandemic, which has shut down economies all around the world. Now, let me just put on notice where Australia has performed um, as against some of its even larger international peers. So, Australia's GT GDP decreased by 7 per cent. We acknowledge that. The US, uh, the United States of America's GDP has shrunk by 9.5 per cent. Germany's 
has shrunk by 10.1 per cent. France decreased by 13.8. The whole eurozone was 12.1. And, Madam Deputy President, the UK, their GDP has decreased by 20.4 per cent. So I think the senators here can see by any measure, the Australian economy has done better than far many of its peers. Now, as I said at the beginning, the uh, fall in GDP, this recession, has been caused by COVID-19. And indeed, in some states where there is no lockdowns, no border closures, like the good state of New South Wales, there is, yes, indeed, green shoots starting to arise because businesses can open. Businesses see the light of day. They see their ability to be able to trade out of this. Unlike, Madam Deputy President, my home state of Victoria, where there is little or no hope. Why? Because we're in lockdown. We're in stage four lockdown, and we're going to be locked down for an awful long time yet. Why are we locked down, I hear you all ask. Well, it's thank you very much, Minister. The reason is that the Andrews state government has failed Victorians, failed them miserably. Why have they failed? Well, let me talk about why they have failed. There is a number of ways that you can protect a community from a pandemic. One, you keep it out of the community. That's called quarantine. That was failure number one for Premier Andrews. So if you've got let it out into the community, and this can happen, as New South Wales has seen you can have outbreaks. Well, then what do you need to do? You need to contain it. How do you contain a pandemic? Well, two ways to do that testing and through contact tracing. Now, New South Wales has provided a gold standard. It provides a lesson to Victoria how to do contact tracing. Victoria's contact tracing is, on any estimate, at about 30 per cent of what New South Wales is. Now, by any measure, 30 per cent is a failure a complete and utter failure. The Andrews state government has failed Victorians. The economy there is going to be strangled because it is not going to come out of lockdown. He's already, the Premier has already stated that he's going to keep us in lockdown for another two weeks longer than the six weeks that was initially planned. So that will be eight weeks of stage four. The number of businesses that I've spoken to that are in desperate straits because they've been, they got through stage three and then stage four, they were just crushed crushed under the weight of not being open their doors. If you want jobs, it's very, very simple. Let businesses open their doors. If you want jobs, let people travel to your state to do business, to go to your tourism sector, to go to restaurants. Not in Victoria. They can't lock down the borders because no one wants to come in in the first place. They have strangled the economy such that it is going to take forever to recover. Now, I know those opposite in coming months and years are going to point at the Morrison government and say, look what you've done. I want, to, I want to put on record here that I will remind those senators opposite at every turn how this happened in Victoria, that it was the Andrews state government that failed Victorians, continues to fail Victorians, is now even locking them up for a Facebook post. This is shameful behaviour, absolutely shameful behaviour. And I, for one, condemn it. Thank you, Senator Van. Senator Ayres. Madam Acting Deputy President, well, we've seen in Senator Van's response the essence of the problem with the coalition's approach. Uh, the problem with the coalition's approach is they blame everybody but themselves. Uh, the, the problem that Senator Van points to with uh, lockdowns and border closures around the country is a direct result of failed national leadership of a national cabinet that's neither national nor a cabinet but is just a photo opportunity and a complete vacancy of national leadership from this Prime Minister is a key reason why the Australian economy is in free fall. There will be more Australians unemployed because this government's JobKeeper and JobSeeker package was too little, too late and badly designed. There will be more Order. Australians unemployed in the economy, and there are now more Australians unemployed in the economy, because the economy was in a terrible state in 2019. The growth that Senator Van referred to is imaginary growth. There was no growth. 
we had, we had wage stagnation, no real wage growth, good jobs disappearing across the economy, productivity falling. The economy was in free fall, and that's one of the reasons why it's so hard to deliver growth at the moment. There will be Order. more Australians unemployed, Order. more people will lose their jobs because this government is cutting the job seeker and job keeper packages. There are a million Australians unemployed today, more people than in our history. 400,000 people, because of your cuts, your cuts will lose their jobs between now and Christmas. And we heard in the minister's answers she can't grapple with the reality. She was quibbling about whether they were cuts or whether it was a continuation of the program. Well, it's pretty simple. Are the JobKeeper amounts going to be bigger or smaller? Are they going to be more or less? She couldn't grapple with the reality and take responsibility for the impact that the withdrawal the tapering off of these, project, the, pr, pr, these, uh, these particular projects, the tapering off over the course of the rest of the year, will mean that more Australians will lose their jobs. It's predicted that 740,000 additional Australians, ANU research, 740,000 additional Australians will be plunged into poverty because of the job keeper and job seeker cuts. What do you think, Madam Acting Deputy President, that means for Australian children in those households? What is the impact of poverty on Australian children? There is a complete disregard on that side of the chamber for the real impact of those cuts. And the minister said yesterday, across much of the economy, she said, we are starting to see green shoots. Well, maybe in the garden parties that the minister goes to in Turak Gardens or Malvern or Gilberton, she sees green shoots. But across Australia, in the country, in our regions, in the suburbs, this is what we see. We see a million lost jobs. We see no vacancies. We see closed businesses. We see dwindling opportunities. And we see cuts to the other opportunities that Australian families look to to lift themselves up. Cuts to universities, the TAFE system in ruins, cuts to job keeper and job seeker. This government is totally out of touch. It's got an incapacity to empathise with ordinary Australians who have got their heads just above water at the moment. They've kept their heads just above water month after month after month, and now the government's going to cut JobKeeper and the government's going to cut JobSeeker, and hundreds of thousands of those people will lose their jobs. And what do you think that's going to mean for Australian families? This government should be focused on a plan for jobs. It should be focused on using the power of government to lift Australians, ordinary Australian families, into work, into jobs, into opportunity, rebuild the economy, but instead what we're going to see is callous, Reaganite, Thatcherism driving a very bad agenda for Australians, a weakened government impact, and that's why many hundreds you, of thousands Senator of Australians Ayers, are going to lose their jobs. Expired. Senator Stoker. Ah, Senator Ayers, the ultimate troll hiding fearfully from the shadows of political figures from other countries in other decades, hiding from these very scary people like Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher. They're not alive and with us, of course, but Senator Ayres is hiding away, terrified that somebody might want to suggest that, I don't know, the economy might need to have the support of this parliament to grow and become um, able to get out of this crisis on its own. It's the kind of crazy, blatant doublespeak we get from those opposite all the time. And I'll give you an example. When those on this side of the chamber extend JobKeeper, providing a gentle transition out of government support for those businesses who are using it as they emerge bit by bit from this economic shock, they don't acknowledge the fairness in that. 
They don't acknowledge the extra help that the taxpayer is providing to keep people in jobs. No, 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 no. We've got to put the most negative spin on it possible. It's a cut, they say. They cannot resist talking down our economy. But you know what? There's something that Australians need right now, and it is to believe that the people in this place want them to go forward, want them to succeed, want to believe in their economy, want to believe that their businesses can get back on their feet and that they're going to have a government to support them to do just that. But those on the other side are intent every day that we are here on running down Australians and their good work. We're prepared to fight for you, Australians. We'll fight for your job. We'll fight for your business. And Thank we'll you, fight Senator for Stoker. The time for this debate has expired. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Polly to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the eyes have it.